I'm Indy Nidell. I'm Pat from Sabaton, and this is Sabaton History. The Battle of Passchendaele in 1917 was an Allied dream to break the stalemate of World War I. Instead, it produced casualties in the hundreds of thousands and remains a symbol for the futility of war. We already covered the Battle of Passchendaele in our song Price of a Mile from the Art of War album, but it felt natural to return to it for the Great War. And now here's the story, and then the song. And the song is great. It's great. The Great War, La Grande Guerre, Der Große Krieg. What exactly could have been so great about the war of 1914 to 1918 that it deserves that name? Cynical question indeed. As the writer H.G. Wells noted, many felt like this would be the war to end all wars, the war against German militarism, the war to reclaim French land, the Pan-Turanian War, and more. It was all of those and none of those. And let's say, once the threat of militarism was gone, or once those lands had been reclaimed, there would be finally a lasting peace again, right? We know, of course, that nothing could have been further from the truth. Historians in general, and even historians of that war like myself, disagree about the exact causes of the outbreak of war in 1914. And there are, in fact, many to choose from, but few can deny that Europe had been chained to a whirling maelstrom of conflicting interests and alliances that was growing ever larger and more precarious, a Gordian knot which when cut meant disaster for the old world. There had been a great war before, you know. The war in 1815 in which another coalition of Europe's nations had fought against a mighty emperor and which had been called great by contemporary politicians and publishers. But Napoleon Bonaparte's defeat and the destruction of his French armies had not brought the everlasting peace many imagined would come. The concert of Europe was designed to keep stability and peace in Europe, but that ultimately failed and opened the continent for total war. It could not prevent revolutions or war after war from breaking out as the decades rolled along. And 100 years after Napoleon, the powder keg filled to the brim with the ambitions and hubris of Europe's leaders exploded once again into an all-engulfing war. If you want to know more about the concert of Europe, we put a link in the video description. Some called the First World War carefully the European War. The Times named it the Kaiser's War, but the terms Great War and World War had been on many lips, even as the guns of August 1914 thundered in the East, the West, and the South of Europe. Nations worldwide, such as the United States, the Ottoman Empire, Bulgaria, Brazil, Italy, Japan, would all join the war, some sooner and some later. But even from the very start, a majority of people seemed aware of the fact that this war, though initially among European empires and their global possessions and mercantile connections, would have a lasting worldwide impact. Still, many intellectuals hailed the hostilities as the, the grand thunderstorm that would clear the air over Europe, and in the aftermath of which there would be a lasting peace. But after the first bloody months, as Hundreds of thousands were killed, marching and charging recklessly into the modern rifles and machine guns of their enemies. The mood quickly soured. The entrenched machine gun became a symbol of how the great nations had opened a Pandora's box that they could not simply close again. And so wrote Maclean's magazine in October 1914. Some wars name themselves. This is the Great War. The high and mighty the kings and statesmen, the bankers, the captains of industry had criminally failed to predict the level of insanity and the scale of death and suffering. The soldiers on the ground, the, the fathers, the sons, the brothers, were to face for years with no end in sight. Gone quickly was the enthusiasm of the first weeks of the war, when troop trains were brightly colored with to Paris or to Berlin when the German army joked that they would just send the police to arrest the British army instead of bothering to send troops, when Russian officers swore off vodka for the duration of the war, when the war was the war that would be over by Christmas. The battlefields of Verdun, 
the Asanzo River Valley, Galicia, the Tigris River, Sarikamish, the Argonne Forest, their names became synonymous with destruction and suffering. For the men stuck fighting the war, they bore more fitting names like the meat grinder, the mountain that eats men, the bone mill. Being sent to the front at Flanders, for example, was pessimistically known as a death sentence. Death rides a pale horse in Flanders, the Germans sang, and John McRae's legendary poem in Flanders Fields described it as a place where the poppies blow between the crosses row on row. Men were no longer even fighting and dying on their feet like they had in earlier wars. Now they, they crawled, they hid, they hunkered down behind earth, wood and concrete. Glory or honor were long gone. Instead, they fought enemies without even seeing them with gas, with grenades, with long range artillery. They slept in dugouts. They lived in trenches or waited in bunkers. And the constant drumming sound of being shelled took a harsh toll on the men's psyches, driving many insane with fear. There was no escape. On the Western Front, snipers and shrapnel barred every way out of the safety of the trenches. On the Tigris, the desert heat, disease, and the floods of the river ground soldiers down. In the Alps, avalanches, ice, and bitter, bitter cold broke the men. For many soldiers, it was a life between the dead, tasting the sweet smell of decay of rotten bodies that lay out there baking in the summer's heat of no man's land. The moans of the wounded and the slowly dying who could not be relieved haunted the soldiers' sleepless nights. Stuck in mud or, or the cold of winter, wounded soldiers who fell into flooded shell holes drowned, too weak to get out on their own. Men grew accustomed to the violence, to death, to killing. Ordinary men, you or me, became indifferent to the suffering of their opponents, brutally killing them with guns, clubs, knives in close combat. The death's head became a proudly worn symbol on many flags during this war. But even then, the men marched on. Despite the horrors, despite the hardships, the men endured year after year, battle after battle. The war grew larger, first in scope as more and more nations joined, then in magnitude as the mega battles of 1916, the year of battles, raised war to a level of horror never even before imagined. And battles raged and grew larger in the skies, on the seas, and even beneath them from the hot deserts the misty swamps, the frozen winters, the soldiers endured on the offensive and on the defensive. The Sabaton song, Great War, references the Battle of Passchendaele, which they have sung about before in The Price of a Mile. The Battle of Passchendaele is one of the more overlooked battles of the Great War, but it was significant. It certainly embodied the futility of the war. Only a small amount of territory was gained for the Allies at the cost of half a million or more soldiers. But this was just one battle of dozens of battles on one single battlefront in a war that had over a dozen major battlefronts. But even all this madness had to end. And when it did, the world had changed. Four great empires had fallen taking their kings and emperors with them. In their stead, in many places, the people rose up to rule themselves in democracies. Many new nations emerged, ready to take their destiny into their own hands, and victor and vanquished alike swore that such a war should never come again. The scale and the ferocity of the Great War should be a warning for future generations not to repeat the same mistakes, not to get dragged down into the abyss of inhuman destruction. The lessons of the war in which we had learned to kill each other by the hundreds of thousands with gas and fire, aircraft and tank, should be an everlasting warning and lead to the triumph of peace over war. But peace did not triumph, nor did the violence stop with the end of the Great War. The fighting and the dying continued far beyond the armistice of November 11th, 1918, particularly, but not limited to Eastern Europe and Russia, where the consequences of the war were revolution and civil strife. This led to a whole new generation of 
brutalized young men who embraced violence as a tool with which to establish power and to further years of bloodshed as civilians died by the millions and warring factions rose and fell. In time, many of those bright young democracies would fail as disillusion and delusion brought a wave of authoritarians to power. No, the peace that was to come did not come. The best advocates for such peace actually were, well, naturally the veterans themselves. Even those lucky enough to escape the Great War without physical wounds, those who had not lost their hands, their feet, their eyesight, they still bore mental scars for the rest of their lives. There are enough tales of men who lived long lives after the Great War, but who even as old men woke during the night screaming at the top of their lungs about shells and incoming attacks. The memories of the Great War never left them. After 1918, the Great War was given many more names and would one day be better known as the First World War to many outside of Europe, but still the name the Great War stuck. Still it sticks. But the question remains, what was so great about it after all? Passchendaele, 1917. No man's land. Not a great place to be. So this song, Great War, is the title track of the album, The Great War. Now, how did you decide that? What made, was that obvious or? Yeah, no, it, it was not obviously at all. When I first heard the music for this song, I felt, oh, this is an, uh, something epic. And came a lot of thoughts came to my head. What is the topic for this song? But I couldn't nail it down until I saw the first draft of the artwork of the new album. Wow. Because I then felt that's the song. And I was reading stories from Passchendaele and somewhere along there I found this uh, story about the three brothers who served there. And as one fell, the, the other two knew that, okay, there is a, a telegram going home oh, to, mom, yeah. to their mom. And as the second fell, only one guy remains and he know that his mom getting another telegram. And uh, he said, I, I'm not gonna give her the third, so no. I'm gonna come home myself. That was a story that I made me think a lot and it inspired to writing the lyrics. Did he come home? He did come home. He did come home. Because that battle, that was a, one of the most depressing parts, of one of the most depressing years of a very depressing war. You have covered Passchendaele before in The Price of a Mile. That's true. And uh, actually, it's referred to in the lyrics of okay. this one a little bit. So there's some teasing to... To tie them together. Yeah, to tie them together. Uh, is it a song that, I mean, are you guys, when you guys go on tour to support the album, is this something you're definitely going to be playing like every night? We don't know that yet. I mean, it's up to all you who watches this as well. I mean, wh what the fans really like is yeah, if they like the song. Well, that's true. We've seen like, songs like Panzerkampf that became fan favorites that weren't fan favorites. So you guys out there, it really is up to you what songs Sabaton will be playing stuff. But how can you know if you like this song or not if you've never heard this song? So, ladies and gentlemen, right now you get to hear a little unreleased Sabaton music. Here's a little bit of Great War. Well, that was a little bit of Great War, the title track of Sabaton's upcoming album, The Great War, which comes out July 19th. And this is Sabaton History. See you next week. All right, everybody, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the Sabaton History channel. Also check out Indies other channels. And if you also want to support us on Patreon, we'd be more than happy because that's what really makes this happen.